dedicated team for working tirelessly to ensure an exceptional program. Finally, I thank you for taking the time out of your schedule this evening and hope that you find the information useful. And we are honored to have representation from our national headquarters on the call. And we'll take a brief moment here to introduce our general president-elect. Dr. Willis L. Lonzo III is a respected leader in the fraternity, in business, and in his community. Noted authority in his own right, he is an executive scientist with 20 years of global pharmaceutical research and development and global medical affairs experience. He was a Charles Waple Scholar in Chemistry at Delaware State University, where he studied chemistry. He also holds the Doctor of Philosophy degree in Biochemistry from the University of Akron, where he was a prestigious Patricia Roberts Harris Predoctoral Fellow. And Dr. Lanzer was also a postdoctoral fellow in physiology and biophysics at the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. He has served in many capacities within the fraternity on local, regional, and general level, all in preparation for his next endeavor. His brother, Dr. Lanzer, will take the office as the 36th general president of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated on January 1st, 2021. Brother Lanzer, welcome. And we appreciate your kind words this evening. Thank you very much, Brother Johnson, for that very generous introduction. <clears throat> I'd like to say, first and foremost, that it is an honor for me to be with you this evening for this groundbreaking event. Uh, certainly, the timeliness of this is unprecedented. Uh, my congratulations are offered collectively to the brothers of Iota Upsilon Lambda chapter for their vision and their foresight is unparalleled in making sure that we are breaking ground and moving in the right direction surrounding the uh, COVID-19 and the onset of now the option of vaccines uh, surrounding the pandemic. Uh, it, is un, uh, it is unnecessary, but I need to say it again that uh, brothers Dr. Michael Smith and Dr. Langston Smith both have been stalwart leaders in their respective uh, fields, but they've also leveraged a presence in our fraternity. And I'm grateful for their palpable energy around this effort tonight. And you're to be congratulated for that. To our distinguished panel, to Dr. Riley, to Dr. Corbett, to Dr. Graham and Dr. Frederick, I'm very happy to see you here this evening and we thank you for your contributions that will no doubt have an unparalleled uh, link of education, hopefully a familiarity and comfortability with where we need to move surrounding, uh, moving forward in, in the vaccination of our population, but particularly in the African-American community. And as I close, I just would say that uh, uh, you are uh, certainly welcome to be on any panel that moves forward as we have a, a, a very robust health initiative that will be associated with my administration. And I look forward to working with you hopefully in the very near future. Thank you very kind. Thank you, Dr. Lonson. And now a brief introduction of our moderator. Brother Sam Fulwood III has been a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity since 1976, when he helped charter the Mu, the Mu Zeta chapter at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. During his career as a newspaper journalist, he contributed to the LA Times 1992 Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the riots following the acquittal of the police officers who were filmed beating Rodney King. He is currently a senior fellow and vice president at the Center for American Progress, where he studies and writes about the intersections of U.S. race relations, politics, and public policy. Brother Fullwood, I pass the mic to you, and thank you for your efforts this evening. Thank you, Brother President Johnson, for that generous interruption, introduction and my hearty welcome and greetings to Brother General President-elect Willis Lonzer. Thank you for being with us this evening. Before we plunge into our discussion with an impressive panel of experts whom I will introduce to you all very soon, I wanna set the table for this evening's conversation. As you've just heard my brothers Johnson and Lonzer say, our webinar arises from the disproportionate impact this terrible virus has wrought upon the nation's black communities. For us to have this conversation in a serious and respectful, respectful manner, I wanna outline how we will proceed tonight for the next hour and a half or so. 
By mutual agreement of the IOTA Upsilon Lambda chapter and our panelists, I will engage in, our, in a conversation that examines in turn three discussion points of key importance to Black Americans. Those discussion points include the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, concerns surrounding the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine, and efforts to dispel fear and skepticism within African-American communities regarding the vaccine. Following our discussion, our panelists will have an opportunity to summarize their thoughts, and then we will open up for questions that those of you in the audience have posed to the panel. You may submit your questions to the Q&A box on the Zoom platform, and my brothers will relay those questions to me and I'll pose them to our panel for answers. So without further delay, let me introduce our distinguished mm -hmm. panel. Dr. Wayne Riley is president of SUNY New York, or SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University, and the chairman of the board of the New York Academy of Medicine, as well as a member of the National Academy of Medicine. He previously was CEO and the 10th president of Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm proud to say that he's my brother and a lifetime member of Alpha Phi Alpha and the former chair of the fraternity's health committee. Dr. Wayne Frederick is president of Howard University, having previously served as the university's provost and chief academic officer. Dr. Frederick is a widely recognized expert on the disparities in healthcare and medical education, who continues to lecture in the University School of Medicine, as well as conduct medical research that focuses on narrowing racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in cancer care outcomes, especially gastrointestinal cancers. Dr. Kismika Corbett is a viral immunologist at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases within the National Institute of Health. Dr. Corbett is currently the scientific lead of the Vaccine Research Center's coronavirus team, making her, in the words of the center's director, Dr. Anthony Fauci, quote, an African-American scientist who is right at the forefront of the development of the vaccine. And Dr. Barney Graham is the deputy director of the Vaccine Research Center and chief of Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory and Translational Science Corps at the National Institute of Health, which makes him Dr. Corbett's immediate boss. Dr. Graham's major area of research includes the, uh, the vaccine and monoclonal antibody developments for viruses, including COVID-19, Zika, HIV, Ebola, and other viral emerging pathogens. For the benefit of our discussion, Dr. Corbett's and Dr. Graham's work were essential uh, in the nation's rapid response to COVID-19 pandemic and the design and development of the vaccine candidates and the antibodies that ultimately led to human clinical trial. So I wanna begin by asking each of them to sort of tell us briefly, how was this vaccine developed? Dr. Graham? I'm gonna let Dr. Corbett go first. <laughs> I'm happy to go first. And, and I must say that it is an, an absolute honor to even be on a panel with Dr. Graham because uh, most of our conversations are around our work and so to be able to educate the community in this way alongside him um, is a privilege. And I thank you for our invite um, together. Um, so this vaccine was developed on the backbones of years of research that we particularly have done at the Vaccine Research Center. So when I started in the Vaccine Research Center uh, six years ago in 2014, another coronavirus was circulating. It was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And while it did not cause a pandemic, it at least alerted us at the Vaccine Research Center that coronaviruses had pandemic potential. And so under Dr. Graham's entire umbrella of research, um, I started to lead the coronavirus team towards understanding how to make a really good vaccine for coronavirus if we shall have a pandemic like we're having now. And so for the last six years, we and our small team under the direction of Dr. Graham have been studying a particular protein that is on the surface of coronaviruses. Um, you may have heard about this in the news. So it is the protein called the spike protein. 
that forms a crown on coronaviruses all encompassing, including MERS coronavirus and this current circulating SARS-CoV-2. And so by studying that protein in so much detail, we were able to figure out um, a trick and a way to deliver that protein so that it elicits really, really good immune responses that are potentially protective to humans. And so for the last six years, what we've been doing alongside collaborators at various universities um, and also in, in conjunction with Moderna, which was at the time a small biotech company, is really understanding how to one, um, make the best spike protein and then how to two, deliver it via revolutionary platforms such as the messenger RNA platform that is being used in not only Moderna's vaccine candidate, but also the other candidate that has emergency use authorization under the FDA, the Pfizer candidate. And so this vaccine development really happened under what we call pandemic preparedness. So that it's our way from a scientific perspective to really have a portfolio of data that supports a vaccine shall a pandemic occur. And then on the onset of this pandemic, we had so much knowledge that it allowed us to fuel this so-called rapid vaccine development where we could come together from the government side at the National Institutes of Health and other and regulatory agencies such as the FDA in conjunction with Moderna to test the vaccine first preclinically. So that is the side of the research that I led from the design all the way through to um, animal models like mice and non-human primates or monkeys. And then from there, the vaccine went into phase one clinical trial where um, the safety of the vaccine was tested. And then from there, the subsequent phase two and phase three clinical trials. And so um, really this vaccine development trajectory happened because of the large amount of research that we've done at the Vaccine Research Center previously and the coordinated efforts with longstanding collaborators, both in academia and in industry. Um, and, and I'll have Dr. Graham finish with um, how, how the phases of the clinical trials um, went about following the preclinical test. Okay. okay, thank you. And uh, it's a, a great honor for me to be with you tonight. And uh, so I appreciate the invitation and it is a joy for me to be on the panel with Dr. Corbett. We've worked together for about 14 or 15 years, um, only interrupted by her PhD at, at UNC. And um, so many people have been concerned about the pace at which this vaccine was developed and are worried that it was developed too quickly. And I want to assure you, building on what uh, Dr. Corbett just told you is that we have been working at the Vaccine Research Center for 20 years to make an HIV vaccine, and we have not been able to do that yet. But the technologies that we have developed along the way to try to make an HIV vaccine have all been come into play as we've worked on this kind of a vaccine for pandemic preparedness and response. And in particular, the last 10 years, when we started learning how to um, not only identify the right shape of a protein on the surface of a virus, but to hold that shape in the right conformation. And so starting with a, a virus called respiratory syncytial virus, similar, it has a protein similar to the spike called F. We were able to figure out how that protein could be a better vaccine. And so, we were learning that about the time that MERS uh, coronavirus came through. And so we got the uh, coronavirus spike structure. And then uh, together with Dr. Corbett and others, as she said, at other universities, uh, we learned how to stabilize it in the right confirmation. And uh, that led to what we call uh, precision antigen design. So knowing at the atomic level how these proteins are shaped and that that protein is the target for the antibody that protects you, we know exactly what we want the immune system to see. And by collaborating with Moderna, a rapid platform manufacturing group, we're combining uh, what we think of as precision vaccinology with rapid platform manufacturing 
And that was the plan starting in 2017 for how to prepare for virus families like coronaviruses that might uh, come into the human population. So we really want people to understand that this has not been just one year of work. It's been at least 11 years of work, if not 20 years of work. I want to, um, I want to draw attention to a, a little bit of what happened in the news today. Um, Vice President-elect um, Kamala Harris went to Southeast Washington to get her vaccination and to do it on camera. And so I want to throw a question to, uh, uh, to Brother Dr. Riley about the community-based uh, uh, immunization, uh, is, if that's a, an effective way to have an outreach to gain confidence in this, uh, in this, in this uh, vaccine in the African-American community. You're working in a community-based uh, institution, and I'd be interested in hearing what you had to say about, about what the vice president-elect did today and how that relates to what's going on in your community. Uh, thank you, Brother Dr. Fullwood, for uh, the uh, question. I want to salute uh, the outstanding uh, IOTA Upsilon uh, Lambda chapter uh, for their great uh, leadership. Delighted to be on the panel and to participate. Hats off, first of all, to Dr. Corbett and Dr. Graham. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these are two of our finest biomedical scientists in, in the country. Uh, and they brought us to this moment uh, where we have uh, at least two and possibly more vaccines uh, to address COVID. So to address your question, yes, I saw the vice president-elect today. She was intentional about where she went to get her first uh, vaccine. She got the Pfizer. Um, and I think it makes a statement. Uh, one thing we do know that we cannot uh, vaccinate uh, as many uh, Af African-Americans and Americans just relying on the ivory towers of the country. We have to be in the community. We have to be in the churches, the community centers, the YMCA's ultimately. Uh, so once the vaccine supply gets uh, sort of caught up with uh, demand and, and access, it's critically important that it go beyond just the ivory towers and the hospitals uh, that many of us uh, work in, uh, that this has to be a, a, a real grassroots effort. It's gonna require the divine nine, if you will, to participate, the links, uh, the, uh, all the African-American professional organizations that all of us are members of. And as I've been telling uh, audiences that uh, Black Lives Matter and science matters to black lives. Dr. Frederick, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing uh, your perspective on this as well, uh, from, the, from the community surrounding Howard, as well as the work that you see. Yeah, uh, again, I also want to echo um, the sentiments that have been expressed uh, to fraternity. Uh, I think this is an important aspect of what we must be doing. Uh, you know, the communities that we serve are, are critical around this issue. In Ward 7 and 8 here in DC, there are eight wards. In Ward 7 and 8, uh, the life expectancy of a Black male is just about 66 years. 95% uh, of uh, the citizens of Ward 7 and 8 are African American. If you go to Ward 3, 95% of the citizens there are white, and the life expectancy is almost 24 years longer. That in and of itself tells you that we have a significant disparity. And when you talk about frontline workers, cashers, taxi drivers, et cetera, you have a high concentration of those in Ward 7 and 8. So the exposure to the virus and ultimately uh, people who will get really ill and succumb uh, to the virus has disproportionately impacted us, as you stated. And so when this first um, occurred, Howard University stood up a testing site um, in Ward 7 and 8 uh, because we felt it was important to provide testing to that community in the same, uh, around the same uh, token, we're really are pushing to ensure that the citizens of there first get information. And I wanna be clear about that. The issue is not to force anyone to take the vaccine. The issue is not to insist that people take the vaccine without um, being educated about it, but we must bring them information. Um, we will also participate in a phase three trial uh, with Novavax and we are going to take a mobile unit into that community as well to carry information about the vaccine. And I think it's extremely important that we do that. I think VP Harris's 
um, intent to go there uh, was important for two reasons. One is to let that community see that a facility in their neighborhood has a vaccine that she deems safe. But the second is just as important. Uh, she actually took the Moderna vaccine developed by Dr. Corbett um, and Dr. Graham. And I think it was very important that a government um, directed or government funded uh, facility was able to demonstrate that because one of the things that we have a problem with in the African American community around this vaccine is the natural mistrust, not just in the medical um, establishments, but in our institutions. So the same uh, concern we have about law enforcement, we imply to everything else. When we have a recession and we have mortgage issues, our banks, we're concerned that African Americans are again treated differently and we can go on and on. And that gets applied to places, unfortunately, like NIH. And so I think it's extremely important that she not only took the vaccine in Ward 7 and 8, but that she also had the Moderna vaccine developed uh, by a federal government agency with federal uh, tax dollars as well. So I, I applaud her uh, for what she did today. And I think it's representative of exactly who she is. And of course, as president of her alma mater, uh, I was certainly uh, filled with pride to see that she made uh, such a very, very wise decision. I'm gonna drill down in a few minutes about the, the whole question of trust um, surrounding the vaccine. But, but before we get to that, I wanna ask um, uh, Dr. Graham and Dr. Corbett about, um, it, 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 we got a really good uh, description of how the, the, the uh, vaccine was, was developed, but I'm curious to know uh, what level of black involvement was involved in that development research and evaluation of, I think the one that you worked on was the Moderna vaccine. Uh, and if you know anything about uh, the involvement of people of color in the Pfizer vaccine, I'd be interested in knowing what, what you can tell us about that. So I'm going to start with from the actual scientific side, and I'll let Dr. Graham speak on the clinical trial side, because I, I think it's important to note that there has been minority involvement at each step of the way. And that starts with the team um, that I lead and under Dr. Graham's direction, um, obviously at the Vaccine Research Center where I'm obviously a black woman and um, many of our teammates are of uh, minority ancestry, black, et cetera. And um, we, we purposely have a very diverse laboratory because the understanding that diverse minds, when they come together, the output is such as this, where you um, can drive forward a product um, very rapidly, um, but also putting those minds together help us to really facilitate getting those types of products out to the community. Um, and so the first thing is that we started with a very diverse subset of scientists that helped to number one, design the vaccine and then test the vaccine preclinically and onward. Um, and then I'll let Dr. Graham speak on the diversity in the clinical trials and, and really um, also Dr. Graham, if you don't mind speaking on how important it was from the NIH side and from Moderna side to make sure that the clinical trials uh, were diverse. Yes, this has been uh, very important to us all the way through, um, not only from the development side, but in the execution side and the testing side. And so uh, that's been important to me in particular. And in the Moderna phase three uh, trial, uh, it enrolled 30,000 people and about 10% of those people were African-American about 15%, uh, almost 20% were Latinx. And um, I, there were fewer than 70% um, Caucasian uh, white in this uh, phase three study. So there was some effort made to have the proportions that way. It, it wasn't even what we had hoped. We hoped that we could have representation for the degree of severity of disease, not just uh, the demographic of the population. So we came a little bit short of the demographic of the population at 10% instead of 13. And we came uh, short of the demographic of the severe disease, which would be more like 25 to 30%. Uh, so it was uh, 
respectable, but not as much as we had hoped. And, uh, but we did make some effort to, to increase minority enrollment. I'm curious to know about how, we've heard a lot of new media reports about the effectiveness of this vaccine. How do you define the vaccine competence uh, that we're hearing about? And what were, what are and what were those metrics and, and how are they interpreted? Can you make that clear for us to understand? Right. And so in the phase three trial, 30,000 people were enrolled and 15,000 received the vaccine, 15,000 received placebo. And then uh, there's a case definition, meaning that if you have mild or moderate uh, coronavirus disease defined by symptoms and a positive PCR, that's a case. That's a case of coronavirus. At the end, uh, looking at two weeks after the second dose of vaccine, uh, at the time it was uh, taken through the FDA advisory committee, there were 196 infections, not 196 cases. 185 of those were in the placebo group. 11 of those were in the vaccine group. And so looking at those numbers, that's how the 94.5 percent uh, efficacy rate is calculated. There are other ways to break that down. So for instance, uh, it's important to know uh, uh, whether people of color were also protected, the subpopulations within this. And so in that case, uh, there were 42 in, uh, cases within people of color, 41 were in the placebo group, and only one was in the vaccine group. So in people of color, it was working at a 97% level. Uh, it's also important to understand whether it's protecting against severe disease or just mild disease. And of the what we call severe cases, meaning you have a low oxygen level or a high respiratory rate or you're hospitalized, all 30 severe cases were in the placebo recipients and there were no severe cases in the vaccine recipients. So at, at both a, a subpopulation level and a severity of disease level, the vaccine was very efficacious. It was more at the level of, of what we see with measles vaccination, better than what we usually see with respiratory virus vaccination. That, that raises a question, and I would just drill just a little bit more down on this. Um, what about uh, specific uh, problems that may be affecting a group of people that maybe wouldn't be for other people? For example, one of the concerns we hear within the African-American community is that maybe their health concerns, their, their social living conditions may be affected, affects their health. Does the vaccine discriminate, that's the wrong word, or or affect people differently uh, based on their health conditions. We, we're hearing a lot about people who are uh, pre-existing conditions and all of that. I'm curious to know, uh, to sort of set people's mind at ease about, does it work the same for everybody? If you uh, separate out people with pre-existing conditions like diabetes or extreme obesity or things like that, um, the vaccine was still working at above a 90% level of efficacy. And so uh, the vaccine may work differently across people, but it's usually uh, more affected by things like age. Ah. And it is like by things like race. There are very subtle differences in the, the patterns and types of immune responses a person may make that could be influenced by race. But in a vaccine uh, studies, you usually see more differences by age. And in people over 65, uh, we also saw a 90% efficacy and, and we were able to measure very good immune responses in the elderly that were virtually the same as the younger adult population that were on average about 40 years younger. And so, um, in every case, uh, in every turn that we made with this vaccine development process, um, it was exceeding our expectations and hopes. I, I just have to say that, uh, you know, there are a lot of ways for a vaccine to fail. 
And uh, we always say there's a thousand decisions to make. And in, in this case, uh, things went very smoothly. And in, in almost every case, it exceeded our hopes. Dr. Frederick, I want to return back to you and uh, sort of address the elephant in the room question that we hear all the time when we talk about uh, medical work. I think you touched on it earlier. Um, confidence within the African-American community uh, in vaccines, in the government, in, in the medical uh, community. We're hearing over and over many people say that they're reluctant to do take the, uh, the vaccine because they remember what happened uh, with the Tuskegee experiment. They remember what happened with the, um, the experimentation over at John Hopkins. I'm interested in hearing you say what, how is this different? Is it different? Do people have a legitimate concern about, uh, about this vaccine given the history that we know in this country? Yeah, you know, I think it's a great question. I, I have a slightly different perspective, if you would allow me. The average African-American in this country, and I would say the average American in this country, if you were to ask them the details of the Tuskegee experiment, couldn't give you the details, to be quite honest. But like everything else, it gets passed on in a mythical fashion. And as I stated before, other abuses of our bodies, of our beings, um, it really causes that mistrust and distrust to grow, right? You can't have a financial crisis, have a mortgage issue, and primarily, disproportionately, African-Americans are affected. You can't turn on your television set in the middle of a pandemic and see a Black man gunned down and not feel that there is a systemic um, attitude of racism towards the African-American existence. And that gets applied further and further. So that's the problem. How do we challenge that? We have to challenge it by making sure that people see and hear from Dr. Corbett, that people see and hear from a Dr. Riley. And we have to be consistent in our engagement of our community. We cannot just show up when there's a crisis and state that we're bringing help if they also see us as the fire starters. So we can't just show up when there's a crisis. We have to show up consistently. And that's why, in my opinion, institutions like SUNY Down State and Howard University and our historically Black colleges and universities are key conduits to carry the message of education, but also to take the lead in making sure that we provide those vaccines. The other thing that I want to, the other point I want to make as well that I think is extremely important is sometimes when we talk about African Americans, the disproportionate impact, the poor mobilities living conditions, et cetera, we think about those as others. And I think that that sometimes really is another thing that we have to stop doing. I have sickle cell anemia and I'm a type one diabetic. I take insulin. I am exactly that African-American that we are concerned about that if I got the coronavirus, um, could have a fatal outcome from it. And so therefore it's my responsibility as well, since I still operate, um, you know, fairly, not infrequently, and I still see patients, I make rounds almost on a daily basis that I got the vaccine uh, last week. And I had to do that. I have to have that same kitchen table or dinner table conversation with my family as well about it. So during the pandemic and, and even now after getting the vaccine, a lot of what my family has been doing has been aimed at helping protect me as well. So my 16 year old and 14 year old are not out gallivanting in the streets, primarily because they recognize that if they are contract this virus, even if they're asymptomatic, they're going to put me at risk. And for that, I'm thankful that they understand that risk as well. But I also have a responsibility to the African American community to take that vaccine as I did after looking at all of the data and the information and to be thankful for people like Dr. Corbett, who developed it and would develop it with our interest. We have laws in place today. We have structures in place today that prevent the Tuskegee experiment from occurring. That's not something that our system um, will be able to accommodate today. And that's why I feel very confident that if we put the right people in front of our community and we give our community an opportunity to get the data, they will then make the right decision. 
brother, uh, Dr. Riley, I want to ask the same question, but maybe put it in a different way. Uh, as a doctor, what would be your prescription for educating inner city, low income populations, at risk populations, reluctant populations uh, on the viability of the vaccine? Well, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Frederick, uh, my distinguished friend. Uh, you know, there is a lot of um, mythology, uh, let's be honest, about the Tuskegee uh, experiment. Uh, first of all, we have to be clear eyed about what happened at Tuskegee. There's a belief that the United States government gave black men in rural Alabama syphilis. That is not true. They found black men in, in rural Alabama who had syphilis, but did not treat them uh, for 40 years. That's and never told the men that you have syphilis. They used obfuscation. So that is one of the first myths. The other unfortunate, uncomfortable truth, as Dr. Frederick will tell you, is that there were black nurses and doctors who participated in the Tuskegee experiment. Um, and Several of them are, were graduates of both Meharry Medical College, where I previously was president, and of Howard University College of Medicine. So we have to own up to our own complicated history with regard to Tuskegee. Tuskegee was a horrible, unethical uh, 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 scourge on American medicine and in the African-American community. But we cannot bring the baggage of Tuskegee to uh, a point in time as an internist. I'm a primary care doctor. I tried to prevent disease. That if we know, as Dr. Graham just so elegantly laid out the data, you know, people can have their own opinion about things, but the fact of the matter is that these two vaccines work well in black folks. They work well in Hispanics. They work well in folks with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, this is, is, is a remarkable achievement of American science that I don't want African-American communities to not have access to. So we have to just be very clear. Say, yes, I understand what happened to Tuskegee, but you got to understand, we got to put that in context. It would be unethical of me as a physician to not suggest that a patient consider the vaccine just as it was unethical for the doctors taking care of those men in rural Alabama for 40 years, not to have given them or offered them penicillin to treat their syphilis. So again, we have to put it in context. Um, and, and again, you know, we have, it's not just listening to nerdy doctors like Dr. Frederick and I and Dr. Uh, Black doctors and scientists, uh, you know, we have to get influencers. We have to get the LeBron James, the Beyonce's, you know, the, you know, whatever influencer can work in any part of <laughs> Southeast Washington or inner city New Orleans, where I'm from, or in central Brooklyn, where I work now. This is, again, as I said, this has got to be an all hands on deck thing, not just left to us, us nerdy types, but to try to make sure we get the information to as many people as possible to get the, the vaccines into the arms of enough black and brown folks to prevent worse outcomes. I'm going to throw a different sort of question about vaccines out that probably is a little bit more um, optimistic than, than uh, the fear that we had about uh, the Tuskegee experiment. I'm old enough to have remembered getting uh, the polio vaccine. And I, I'm interested in hearing uh, any or all of you speak to compare and contrast uh, the, the polio vaccination, which was a national effort uh, to the national effort that we're having with, mm -hmm. with this vaccine. I see you nodding your head, uh, uh, brother. Can you, can, you, can you say something about that? Well, I'm just, I'm just chuckling to myself because of, of, if you have a certain vintage, uh, <laughs> you either know if you got the Sabin or the Sock vaccine. <laughs> and I see Dr. Graham uh, smiling about that too, because you're right, we had a, 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 a sort of a major mass mobilization in, in, in the 50s. Polio was a, a horrible disease, crippling, uh, just debilitating. Um, and again, you know, uh, I think there is a parallel to the way that we approached in some respects, the, the polio eradication, eradication uh, efforts uh, that resulted from two vaccines, uh, the Salk and the Sabin. 
Um, so uh, again, you know, sometimes we don't have to reinvent the wheel with some of these things, but maybe just perfect what was done in the past. So I think that that's helpful. It's not totally the entire way to approach it. Um, but like you said, the, you know, just knowing the, the nods and, and the smiles on, on, we know which one we got. You, know? you, you were mentioning the, the two, and I, I have to confess, I don't know the difference between the two. I remember <laughs> the sugar cube. Now, which, well, one, which was that? <laughs> if Dr. Graham helped me out. I think that's, that's, the, Saban. that's the Saban. That was the Saban. Right. It was a little sugar cube, and then, uh, yeah. but then uh, that was uh, then uh, Dr. Jonas Salk came along and and did something a little different. Uh, so again, you just got confirmation, Dr. Graham. He 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 knows that it was a little sugar cube thing, and then then it was uh, progressed to another uh, another modality. But think about that. Think about how much polio was prevented with those two uh, programs, Salk and Sabin. A number of people are sort of curious about the, the vaccine distribution. And again, what I remember of, we did that in elementary school and mm -hmm. everybody lined up in the cafeteria right. and they sort of asked you to open your mouth and they put it on your tongue. It was universal. Some people are concerned because this virus or this, this virus is new and novel and the, the vaccine is even newer and more novel um, about the distribution. Uh, and where is it going? Who's getting it? Uh, who is not getting it? I'd be interested in hearing some comments about that. Well, I, I did, we got to protect uh, Dr. Graham and Dr. Dr. Corbett on this. Um, I do think there are there have been some glitches in lack of Come on, dude. In, you speak, not me. In, in the distribution of the vaccine. I heard Dr. Fauci this morning say that it was the original intention to have about 20 million healthcare workers vaccinated by two days from now. That's not going to happen. I think uh, Dr. Ram, Dr. Corbett, we're only up to about 1.2 million uh, healthcare workers uh, uh, vaccinated. Um, so I do think there have been some missteps in, in terms of the way that the distribution was organized. I will. I had the Pfizer vaccine last week, like Dr. Frederick, my first dose. I feel fine. Never, no worse than a flu shot. But the thing that I just got advised two hours ago, we have not received our second batch of Pfizer vaccine. So we had to cancel. We had 300 people scheduled today and tomorrow to get the vaccine, but we had to cancel those appointments because we didn't get the vaccine in time. So this is a huge issue uh, that I know Dr. Frederick's probably dealing with uh, at Howard as well. Uh, it, it's frustrating when we know we have a great vaccine, we need to get it into as many arms as possible you know, 85% of my uh, healthcare workers at Downstate are African-American or Afro-Caribbean. I wanted in as many of those arms as possible. Um, and, and so again, I think, you know, there, there has been, uh, unfortunately, a lack of, uh, of, of, of strong uh, sort of planning around the distribution. Yeah, I, you know, just to piggyback on that, I think this is a very, very important issue. And Dr. Graham alluded to this earlier in his comments about setting up the trials in a way that would disproportionately have representation for those who are most vulnerable. So with that framework, when you distribute the vaccine, uh, you also want to make sure that you get to the most vulnerable populations as quickly as you can. And that's why uh, the CDC recommendations um, were in the manner that they are. But we have to ensure that the, those who are disproportionately impacted get it. And around the African-American community, there, there are two grave issues that we must be mindful of. If we get to late spring, or I should say around April or May, and we don't have enough African-Americans or frontline workers who have received the vaccine, and everybody else begins to open up the economy, begins to get back to restaurants, getting in taxis, et cetera, we could disproportionately impact African-Americans even further because those frontline workers who would not have been protected by a vaccine that works will now be vulnerable to getting the coronavirus. You look at what impact that will have on their health, potential mortality, and then you add the economics that would then come with that, with them being disproportionately ill, not being able to participate in a reopening of the economy. And you could really set African-Americans back even further and I would argue that the impact that that, would, that that would have on our community and our society as a whole is something that could last decades if we don't act now and, and make sure there's an intervention. And by the way, Dr. Corbett and I 
I don't think um, either of us uh, took either the same, you know, the salt, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also an indication that vaccines work. <laughs> You're rubbing it in, Frederick. Oh, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed by that one. <laughs> Dr. Corbett, uh, given that, that your work uh, in developing uh, vaccines started before we even knew about uh, the current COVID-19, and uh, do you think that future pandemics are likely or could ha occur uh, to even more novel coronaviruses uh, or other types of viruses in the future? Does this, does this vaccine cure us for all time of, of uh, viruses like this? Yes, I think that um, Dr. Graham and I actually wrote a commentary on this concept, um, I, I think in the early spring, where we called it World on Fire. And the idea was to introduce the, this concept that pandemics are imminent to some extent. Um, there are about 24 viral families, coronaviruses being one of those families for which pose for pandemic threat for humans. And so aside from coronaviruses, which have shown over the course of the last two decades that they obviously have pandemic potential, there are other viruses that could um, cause this type of spread where they jump from animals and start to infect humans and start to transmit from human to human and cause this kind of, of, of global pandemic. So yes, uh, pandemics are imminent. The idea um, around what we did in, in the case of coronaviruses where we prepared from a vaccine standpoint, that type of idea could be transplanted across the other 23 viral families as well. So no, um, most likely if there were another coronavirus, depending on how far um, uh, um, it is uh, um, in relative to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, this vaccine will likely not protect us against a future coronavirus pandemic, but what could be transplanted is the knowledge that we've gained in this, such as the protein to express and the type of platform that we might want to deliver the vaccine. And that type of knowledge could not just be transplanted in, in uh, the case of another coronavirus pandemic, but, but for many of the other viral families as well. And so it really plays on this concept of what we call pandemic preparedness. Okay. What about the durability of the vaccines? Uh, is the uh, efficiency of it consistent across the spectrum or does it diminish over time? I know that there's some concerns with one of them with, the, with regard to the temperature, but uh, are, these, are these stable enough to be uh, long-term solutions? So uh, I think that, that question comes in, in two parts. The first of which is the stability of the actual um, material that's inside of the vaccine vial. Um, which I think both companies, at least Pfizer and Moderna, are, are working steadfastly to ensure that they get viable vaccines um, to the populations that need uh, viable vaccines. And the storage temperatures, I think, over time will, will, will steadily increase um, and become more reliable. But for now, the vaccines can be stored at respectable temperatures for upwards of a year even. And then there's the other side about the durability of the immune response that the vaccines generate in people. Um, we recently were authors on a manuscript from our phase one clinical trial, which again started in, in March, um, where we showed the durability at least through three months after the second dose of the Moderna vaccine, where we don't see any real significant waning um, of the antibody responses in those people from the phase one clinical trials. And um, there are obvious questions around um, durability. And I think a lot of that comes because of our understanding from what is our most common vaccination, which is the influenza vaccine, which is given as a seasonal shot. And so the one thing that we all must remember is that flu viruses are starkly different than coronaviruses in their genetic diversity. So as the seasons change and as the uh, flu viruses circulate each year, the virus strains that come around the next year are so different that any immunity that you might have had from previous circulating strains is non-existent. That level of virus diversity, despite what you see um, in the media around different variants and new strains and, and et cetera, that level of viral diversity is, is not present in the SARS-CoV-2 viral family. So if we can elicit high enough of level of immune responses 
that stick around in a long lasting fashion as some of the preliminary data from phase one clinical trial and also animal studies suggest, then we expect that we might be eliciting long enough um, immunity to get us over several years, um, hopefully. Okay. Um, the vaccine attacks uh, once one is infected, is that correct? Um, so the, the immune response, so vaccines are preventative, right? So the idea is that you arm your body with the right type of immune response so that if your body sees a virus, it is ready to protect you against that virus or protect you against infection. So, so the research really is dealing with blocking or impeding the transmission of the virus. The research is dealing with blocking or impeding the virus from um, getting into cells and replicating in the body so that hypothetically, yes, you might decrease transmission, but more off is that you're decreasing one's um, ability to get COVID-19 disease um, and, and, and particularly severe, more severe COVID-19 disease, but even mild COVID-19 disease. So why is it necessary to have uh, two inoculations where instead of one, and what happens if you don't get the second one? I can let Dr. Graham answer the what happens about what if you, what if you don't get the second one. Um, but, you know, I like to think, so we call this in vaccinology a prime and a boost. So it's, it's like giving your immune system a practice run, right? The first shot really primes your immune system. It's the first time your immune system is seeing this antigen or the spike protein that the, the messenger RNA is delivering. And it's really waking your immune system up. And then once you get your second shot for Pfizer, which will be three weeks later, or for Moderna, which will be four weeks later, that shot tells your immune system to recall what it saw before, so you get a boost in that immune response. And generally speaking, as we look about historically around uh, vaccine development, um, that boost really gives you the high level potent immunity that is generally more long lasting. Um, and I'll let Dr. Graham speak on uh, one dose versus two as it uh, pertains to the efficacy that we saw in the phase three clinical trial so far. Yes, um, you know, a lot of our vaccines are given more than once. So a lot of the childhood vaccines are given on a two, four, six month schedule. So it is, uh, when you're developing immunity, it's a, a matter of uh, numbers and timing. And so if you can generate a larger amount of antibody or a larger number of cells that can provide immunity, uh, you will have a faster response, an immune response, uh, if, if you get infected with the virus. In the case of Moderna and in the case of uh, Pfizer, both, it looks like uh, there's a lot of protection even after the first dose. So starting around day 10, you can see the curves separate. And by the time you get your second dose in the Moderna trial at day 28 or 9, uh, they're very separated. And so you're getting a lot of protection after one dose, but we don't know how long that would last. And so the vaccine has been tested as two doses. And even though we think we could get a lot of a protection from a single dose, uh, we recommend that you get two doses because that's how it's been tested. And that's what will probably give you a, a longer term of immunity. I'm going to uh, uh, shift gears before we go to asking uh, the questions from our um, viewer audience and give each of you uh, an opportunity to, to give us a very brief summary of, uh, of your view about the, uh, the vaccine. If there's an appeal you want to make, if there's a, a statement that you want to make that would be in closing before we start taking some questions from our audience. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go... Uh, I guess I'll start with uh, with you, Dr. Frederick. Yeah, again, I want to thank you for putting this on. I think these are the things that we have to do um, in order to get the word out. I think a couple of things I'd like to leave with. One is uh, when I talk about the Tuskegee experiment and our lack of knowledge is to encourage us to educate our own about these things. Transparency is key. 
I'm not by any means suggesting that the Tuskegee experiment was not a big deal, wasn't serious. But what I am concerned about is that we often go past giving education about what, ha what has happened in the past. And so I think we should do the same thing with respect uh, to the vaccine. We need to go to our community and educate them about it. Once they're educated and we're fully transparent about it, they can make the right decisions. And then the second thing that I do want to underscore is that we do have superstars in our community that we have to uplift. And there are influencers that should participate, but on the same token, I hope that we will elevate people like Dr. Corbett um, and Dr. Riley more so in our society because our young African-American uh, brothers and sisters need to see uh, people like them leading these types of charges as they go forward. So again, I want to underscore that I think what BP Harris did today by going into Southeast DC and, and getting her vaccine there is exactly what makes us proud about her HBCU heritage. Dr. Riley? Well, again, uh, I loved everything my dear friend, Dr. Frederick just said, but uh, for everybody who's participating tonight, um, if you don't remember anything of what anybody said, just remember that you had an African-American woman scientist who was there at the creation of these two vaccines under the leadership of a great mentor and a great leader like Dr. Graham. Uh, this should bring our community lots of comfort that Dr. Corbett was there along with her colleagues with, un, working under Dr. Graham and Dr. Fauci. And if you've ever heard Dr. Fauci talk about Dr. Corbett, it, it is pretty amazing. Uh, he, he is very pride, uh, filled with pride at, over her scientific career and her contributions. So remember that. Uh, number two, you heard the data from Dr. Graham. Uh, I've read the data. Uh, he makes it sing. This, <laughs> these vaccines are great, friends. And I am, I am level set at getting these vaccines into as many black and brown arms as possible by sharing the information, uh, answering questions, addressing concerns and fears, because I know this COVID is, is just wreaking havoc in our community. Uh, you, know, I, you know, there's not an African-American alive who doesn't know someone or have a family member who's had either had it or passed away from it. Uh, and we've got to address this uh, for the future of our communities all over the United States. Dr. Graham? Yes. Um, I want to echo something uh, Dr. Riley said earlier. Um, I'm married to an African woman uh, who's a HBCU graduate from Fisk. And Outstanding. So I have uh, African-American children and grandchildren. My daughter, uh, who's very precious to me, enrolled in the Moderna trial in LA at the UCLA site. Uh, I was, she trusted her daddy and I trusted the vaccine. And so she went to be immunized. My greatest concern is what you said earlier, Dr. Riley, that um, right now there's about a three times disparity of between African-American, some other minority populations and white populations in terms of numbers of infections, severity of infections, hospitalizations and death. If that, if that group who has more disease, more infection in the community has less vaccination rate and the community with less virus in the community has a higher vaccination rate, my greatest fear is that a year from now, there will be a six times disparity instead of a three times disparity. And we cannot let that happen. That, that would be another failure of our institutions to do the right thing. And what we want to do is bend the needle. Since I'm with Alpha Men tonight, we want to bend the arc back toward the trust. Mm -hmm. We don't want to leave it uh, going the other direction. So well said. I'm going to, I'm going to give the, uh, the last word uh, in this round to, uh, to, to Dr. Corbett. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm actually very happy that Dr. Graham just said that out loud because as I've been speaking in these community events, I've been very hesitant to say, well, you know, my boss, his, his wife is black and his, his black daughter participated in the phase three clinical trial, um, mostly because that is, is his private information. But 
one of the things that um, really stands out to me is that as my purpose has shifted um, throughout this vaccine development, um, firstly, really as a viral immunologist with just a passion for understanding the science um, combined with what I think vaccines do wholeheartedly is they obviously prevent disease, but I think when taken, um, they can help to diminish some health disparities as we probably will see in this case, if a large amount of minority communities do uptake the vaccine, um, is that I am, I'm black. And um, sometimes what that can look like, particularly as I sit um, at the National Institutes of Health, which is a government institution, is that I was placed here to convince people to get the vaccine, particularly black people. And what I want to say is that that is just not, that, that is not true. I'm here because I want to be here. Um, and I chose to work in Dr. Barney Graham's lab because obviously because of his extensive research, he is a vaccinator. I mean, he has, he's modest, but he has several vaccines in, in high level phase clinical trials, not just for coronavirus, but his portfolio of vaccine development is extensive. And um, if I was going to work along anyone, it would be besides someone who was great. Um, and then secondly, besides someone who cared about my community as much as I do, and I've seen that. I, the first combined talk that Dr. Graham and I gave in the beginning of this pandemic was um, to his church, which is a black church. And he really takes up interest in making sure that we are well. Um, and that is very important to me from a scientific perspective, but also as I think about what my, my purpose is as someone who has trickled into vaccinologist territory as opposed to just viral immunologist territory. So I just wanted to, to really leave on, on the note of um, particularly echo echoing what Dr. Frederick said in that this is not about convincing anyone to get the vaccine. Actually, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to convince anyone to do anything with their health without knowledge. This is about making informed decisions about your health and making informed decisions about your community's health so that we can start to rise above some of these statistics that systematically have just been plaguing us for centuries. And I, I think that being on a webinars like this is the first start as you, you start to really become informed and you start to latch to the voices that, that you heed and that you trust. And then secondly, um, starting to understand that as history, as history has passed and as time has passed, history has definitely changed. So um, this is not the Tuskegee experiment. As, as was said, this could, that would not be able to happen, particularly under Dr. Graham's watch and also under my watch. And I think one of the very stark differences is that the African-American nurses and doctors that had any, in, any input in the Tuskegee experiment did not have any input at all. And I have a choice of what I do and I would not have tried have enrolled my family and my friends in a phase three clinical trial for a vaccine that that I did not trust. Um, and, and that's that's where I want to leave it. And I get my vaccine tomorrow. So um, I, as we think about you know building trust and, and all of these things, um, I'm happy to communicate with anyone about how I feel afterwards or or what have you. But I, I think that the first the first real step as we start to build trust is, is number one, to lend a little bit and to um, also as you lend trust to, to lend accountability. And I think that that's what the community is doing in, in all right now. So I, I'm thankful for the highlighting of that um, and, and for highlighting that accountability. And um, thank you all for inviting us to this panel. It's been, it's been great. Uh, Dr. Corbett, since you're getting the, the vice vaccine tomorrow, that really uh, is a perfect lead in to the, first, to the first question that, that one of our audience members asked. Uh, and so I'm gonna read the question. Uh, I don't know who asked it, but the question was, I understand that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines do not contain the virus itself. For those of us who probably will not have access to the vaccine until late 2021, will the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines be gone? And will we have to take a vaccine that does have the, uh, the virus included? Um, 
I can answer that question in that um, there are currently, so the vaccines that people are talking about where the virus is included are what we call inactivated vaccines. So this is where um, whole virus um, is manipulated in the laboratory setting so that it is less infectious, but it is good enough that it triggers the immune system to be able to respond to the, vi the real virus if someone comes in contact with it. There are currently no inactivated vaccines in the United States vaccine portfolio at all. Um, there are different platforms though, however, that for example, one might have heard of Novavax, which recently adva advanced into a phase three clinical trial, I think actually yesterday, which uses a protein-based vaccination. So that's basically just spike protein um, that you will give to the body. With not any, without any of the other virus. Um, and then there are other candidates like AstraZeneca's and Johnson and Johnson's where they've taken the insides or all of the replication machinery or anything that could potentially be harmful, so to speak, out of another cold, cold virus called adenovirus. And they've put inside of that the gene for the coronavirus spike protein so that your body gets excited by the backbone of a cold virus, but then that, that spike protein, it sees that spike protein as well. And then there are also the um, mRNA candidates. Um, it is my understanding that both Pfizer and Moderna have really pulled the trigger on um, making sure that there are large amounts of vaccines that are available through next spring when a lot of the general public will start to get the vaccinations. Um, Moderna, I think 100 million or more doses of Pfizer's vaccine was just purchased by the US government, et cetera. Um, but everyone should be fully informed that whatever vaccine they do get, um, most likely Pfizer's or Moderna's and any of the other ones that are in the US's vaccine portfolio will not have whole virus in them. Um, I got a question from uh, Kenton Marinard. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, and he wants to know, he says that he's a researcher in Georgia and he was uh, curious to know if the vaccine could impact fertility in black women. Uh, he wanted to hear from the panel about that. Dr. Graham, you actually should take this um, because I have a very scientific answer. <laughs> um, well, uh, my short answer is no. No. <laughs> uh, when we inject this RNA, it's packaged in this little lipid droplet, a little fat droplet. And that is to stabilize it and to also carry it into the cell. But when mRNA goes into the cell, it stays in the outside part of the cell compartment. It doesn't go into the nucleus where your genes are, where your chromosomes are. So the mRNA only has to get into that outer part of the cell, make a protein, and then it's gone within about 24 to 74, uh, 72 hours. Even the protein from the vaccine is only lasting 72 hours to maybe seven days. So whatever was there in the vaccine is gone within a week. And it certainly doesn't get into the nucleus of your cell or do anything to the cell function. And most of the vaccine is either in the muscle or in cells that have carried it to the lymph node. It doesn't spread all over the body. I got to call it's as scientific as mine would have been, <laughs> but it was good. Well, just as a physician, I will say that as Dr. Graham will tell you, they, there were women study participants who became pregnant during the trial. Uh, so that alone uh, can tell you that uh, it does not have any uh, 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 evidence. There's no evidence that it, it adversely affects fertility at all. Uh, someone asked, uh, since the vaccine is 94.5% effective, what was the outcome of the almost 6%? <laughs> uh, those those uh, few people, the 11 people in the initial analysis uh, had mild disease. So they... Uh, they had infection that was documented and they may have had uh, cold symptoms, but they did not have severe disease and it, it was gone very quickly. So it, it left them very quickly. Um, I guess I'm gonna throw this one to, to Dr. Frederick and uh, to Dr. Riley. 
or anyone who want to answer this, there's a lot of false information circulating on social media. What can you say to the community that uh, increasingly gets its information through word of mouth spread by social media, uh, particularly in a time of pandemic? Yeah, I'll, I'll reserve my comments on social media. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's probably for another panel. Right. <laughs> uh, but what I would say is one of the responsibilities that I think on here you have over 900 participants tonight. Every single one of you has the responsibility to have this conversation with somebody you love, um, with someone in your neighborhood. We talk a lot now about our appreciation for frontline workers. While you're checking out at the grocery store, I hope that you could take a minute to tell the cashier thanks and to also um, at least have a conversation with them about whether or not they've received any information or know of anywhere that they have gone to in terms of on websites to look up information about the virus. I think the key for all of us right now is to get our community as educated as possible about what's taking place. And that's the best way that we can fight uh, the misinformation. We each have the, that responsibility to do that. So yeah. let's see, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree with that. Let me let me give you two uh, or three examples of, of, of quote unquote celebrities who uh, within the past six months have, have spouted what I refer to as anti-vaccine sophistry. Uh, Dwight Howard, uh, I think Orlando Magic, uh, Otto Porter Jr. from uh, I think the Phoenix Suns uh, and the terrific actress who is in um, in 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 uh, Chad McBosen's last movie. Uh, she recently spouted some very unknowing uh, sort of opinions about vaccines. Uh, let me be clear, I can assure you that the black mothers of all three of those individuals made sure they got their shots when they were school age and when they were infants. Um, so that alone is, is a fact um, that should uh, sort of uh, begin to dissuade some of the, the uh, again, what I, I got to call it what it is, just vaccine ignorance and sophistry. So no, if you have a legitimate questions about a vaccine, like, hey, uh, doc, what, how does the vaccine, how was it made so fast? Or, or, or how does it hurt? Uh, you know, those kind of things. But to just spout off, you know, I don't believe in vaccines when I, you know, darn sure that their black mothers made sure they got their shots all, all through their life. So we have to be somewhat uh, muscular uh, in our response, but also in an educational way to rebut some of this. And again, social media, I agree with, uh, with uh, you know, Dr. Frederick, social media can be a forum and a means of spreading ignorance as we know about a lot of things in, in American life. And it's, it's, it's particularly true of this. So uh, to the extent that, you know, people will listen to Dr. Corbett, Dr. Graham, myself, Dr. Uh, Frederick, uh, you know, and others uh, of you, uh, we need to put those folks out on social media as well. I, I, I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse on this subject, but but this question really does ring for me, and I want to I'm going to pose it out there anyway. Uh, Celesi Celesi Clue, I'm, I'm hoping I'm get your name right. Uh, Sit writes, I'm an eighty I'm eighty three years old, have had open heart surgery, and have a heart murmur. Up until 1985, I would take the flu shot each year and I would get flu-like symptoms each year. After 1985, when I stopped taking the flu shot, I have not had the flu-like symptoms. My question is, do you recommend that I get the vaccine? Who would you like to ask that to? Whoever wants to answer. As a, as a physician. Call. As a physician, I would recommend that she take this vaccine. Uh, at 85 years of age with some of these underlying conditions, if she does get infected, she has a, a, high, uh, a high risk for a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, if she wants to have more peace about visiting grandchildren and other uh, people who may wanna be in her presence, uh, I would recommend taking the vaccine. I agree with Dr. Graham. As a physician, as a primary care general internist, who, you know, I would uh, advise uh, uh, you know that 85-year-old young uh, uh, young lady. Yes, uh, you've you've had an amazing streak of good luck 
uh, in terms of the flu, uh, but I wouldn't want to chance it with COVID. Uh, so uh, again, obviously talk to your doctor, but I think the consensus among all the doctors on this webinar would be, yes, you should get it because you are the type of patient, unfortunately, that COVID has focused like a laser beam on. Uh, patients with diabetes, heart disease, um, you know, uh, hypertension. Uh, it, it's to me, it, COVID is like a magnet for folks with these diseases. So, to the extent that you, we can prevent that, uh, you are the classic patients, ma'am. Who, as an internist, I would have no problem in my exam room saying I would suggest you consider taking this vaccine. Are you still contagious if you take the COVID-19 vaccine? Can you still transmit the virus? If, if you, uh, the way these respiratory virus vaccines work is you get immunity, mostly through antibodies, and those antibodies can penetrate your lung tissue and your lower airway. That's why you're protected against disease because that's where the disease happens. They do not necessarily completely protect against infection of the upper airway. So you could still get an infection. You'd probably have a lower amount of virus and you would shed for a shorter amount of time. And you, you may not even have symptoms, but you might occasionally still be able to be infected. So I think people still need to be careful. And I just want to say one more thing. Uh, to the woman um, who, just, who just asked about vaccination. She has had several influenza infections in her life and, and also several vaccinations. So she has a lot of influenza immunity already. It may not be perfectly matched for that year. She has no immunity for the coronavirus. And so she's starting from scratch. And I just really would encourage her to give herself a little bit of a head start if she does get infected. I was, I was waiting for the science of that, of that, of that piece and, and the, I can tag along um, with a comment um, from a science perspective in that uh, I, I hear anecdotally people say, oh, I got the flu vaccine and then I ended up getting the flu. Well, um, the flu vaccine, the seasonal flu vaccine is by no, by no way perfect at all. That's actually why Dr. Graham's other job is around um, bettering the flu vaccine and also why I spent three years working under our influenza team at the BRC because we understand that the flu vaccine is not perfect, but it is good and it obviously is still a recommended seasonal vaccine. But also when people say, oh, I got the flu, there are other respiratory viruses that cause influenza-like symptoms. And so you can get an influenza vaccine and still come in contact with another respiratory virus that might not have been the flu. Um, so that is a very, I think, uh, broad statement to make without some validity around what type of virus you might have gotten. And the other thing from that is that I couldn't really necessarily tell from her, from her question, but one thing that is an important to note around um, vaccinations is that you will feel something even just from your shot. Right. So with getting, um, for example, these uh, mRNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, you might feel tenderness in your arm at the injection site. You might have a fever, um, you know, et cetera, that might happen. Um, So-called side effects or reactogenicity, as, as we call it in vaccinology. But that doesn't mean that you actually got a virus. And we don't necessarily say that synonymous with having symptoms of, of the virus, but of, you could potentially feel something. So I think that's important to note. And I actually, I actually want to secondly back up our science just a little bit because Dr. Graham remains um, continuously modest. <laughs> um, yes. um, but um, in, re in regards to um, uh, what, he, what he said about the transmission, it is, is definitely, um, on us, even as we get vaccinated, to, re to remain vigilant around wearing masks until there is some mass amount of the population that is vaccinated. And, and also until we really understand how these vaccines might impede um, uh, transmission dynamics. But we have published, and I have to just plug um, my team's work from the preclinical side, we have published these vaccines and the data from non-human primates. And we were actually the first to show with Moderna's candidate that we were able to um, decrease the amount of viral replication 
in the upper airway, in the nose, in vaccinated monkeys that got a ton of virus delivered to them. So there is hope that um, the immune response that you generate from these vaccines will decrease, as Dr. Graham says, the amount of virus um, that is replicating in your body. But until we know for sure um, about how these vaccines affect transmission, it is very important to uh, stay vigilant around wearing your mask, et cetera. I was going to say something about the, uh, the, the age discrimination of our panel. Uh, I see so many gray hairs uh, or no hair in the, uh, in the audience, but someone asked a question which, which speaks to, and we, I asked a couple of questions about older people taking the, the vaccine, but someone asked a question and, and we've seen a lot of comments about children. Um, and so I, I'm gonna close out with one last question before uh, we, we wrap up about the effectiveness and the safety uh, on children, because I think I've heard that children are not in the, in the trials so uh, are only old people going to be protected and young people just don't get sick? Or what can we say about that? Young, Anybody can get a, it. A lot of people say that young people don't get severe disease, but um, it's not true. They just get it a lot less commonly than older people. And there have been several hundred uh, young people who've died of this, and even 20-year-olds who are fit die of this coronavirus disease. So I wouldn't take it lightly. Right now, the emergency use authorization for Pfizer is from 16 years and up. And for Moderna, it's 18 years and up. And both of those companies have current trials ongoing uh, down to 12 years of age. And so uh, you could enroll your teenager in those trials if you're near a trial site, or uh, hopefully within a year or so, there, there'll be an indication, uh, maybe early, earlier than that, that those children down to 12 years of age could be vaccinated. I, I suspect that eventually this will become a seasonal childhood disease, low, low amount of disease, upper airway disease, and so eventually we would, it would be good for us to immunize our children, but it's gonna take some time to get into those special populations. I, this has been a really wonderful night. I've learned a great deal. I, I'm certain that those of you who are out in the audience and in cyber world have, have learned something that you didn't know before. Our intent behind this whole program was to give you information so that you can make decisions that would be in your best interest. So I want to thank our panel, uh, Dr. Kismika Corbett, Dr. Wayne Fredericks, Dr. Bonnie Graham, Dr. Wayne Riley for just being very, very informative and knowledgeable uh, tonight. I wanna thank uh, General President-elect Willis Lonza for being with us. He stayed with us the whole evening. We're so thankful to have you here, Brother President. Um, and I want to also uh, give a shout out and a thanks to our two sponsors for pulling this program together, Dr. Langston Smith and Dr. Michael Smith. You heard from Dr. Langston Smith earlier in the program. You're going to hear in a minute from uh, Dr. Michael Smith. And what you don't know and don't see is the behind the scenes work of uh, brothers Timothy Robinson and Michael Pierre, who work behind the scenes as our tech team to be able to pull this whole event together this evening. So a big shout out, a big thanks uh, to, to those guys behind the scene. Um, Brother Mike Smith, could you speak to us uh, and close us out this evening? Yes. Thank you, Brother Fullwood. Really appreciate it. Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity develops leaders, promotes brotherhood and academic excellence while providing service and advocacy to our communities. As part of providing that service and advocacy, the Montgomery County chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is proud to sponsor webinars where one can get trusted and factual information from national leaders in their respective fields. Leaders who are not only experts, but have a vested interest in alleviating health disparities in the African-American community. We hope that you found this information helpful. Thanks again to our esteemed panelists, but most of all, Thank you for joining us tonight. We wish you a 2021 filled with hope, health, and prosperity, and look forward to seeing you on future informational webinars. Happy New Year and good evening.